Well, welcome everyone to episode seven of Come Together, our free weekly webinar series. We are opening our doors in these crazy times to show you our very own strategies and techniques for effective communication, virtual and otherwise. Each week, we spend 30 minutes with some of Duarte's communication experts. We talk through a relevant topic. We answer your hard-hitting questions. We take you behind the scenes here at Duarte to see how we solve the world's toughest communication challenges for the top brands and thought leaders of our time. I'm Doug Neff, the content director for Duarte, and I'm your host. And last week, if you remember, we talked with Cody Dishman about getting everything you can from your virtual platform, whatever virtual platform you were using. This week, we're going to dive back into your presentation, specifically the content of your presentation. And I'm excited to see where we go there. I've brought another special guest. You've already met her if you've been sitting with us. Uh, she's a content developer and executive speaker coach at Duarte. She's a licensed speech language pathologist. It's a mouthful. She's one of the coolest people I know. Please Aww. welcome Nicole Lowenbrown. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Nicole, we have talked throughout this whole series about this new virtual world we're all living in. And in fact, you and I, the last time we were on a webinar together, was before this series, and it was a longer webinar just on virtual communication. Who knew <laughs> what we were about to face? Yep, and um, for how long? So what have you brought to talk with us about today? Well, today we're gonna talk about the content of your virtual communication. In other words, what you say. Now, you have all for the last couple months been on the audience end of virtual presentations and meetings, so you know how distracting this work from home thing can be. You are up against kids, pets, your audience's inbox, back-to-back -back virtual meetings, the Tiger King, copious amounts of snacks <laughs> and alcoholic beverages in your cabinet. They're just calling your name. So it is no wonder that everyone is feeling distracted. And in fact, we found this really incredible statistic from Forbes that says more than 80% of American employees have reported feeling significantly more distracted since they started working from home. So when you are the one creating the content for these engagements, you know, based on your experience as an audience member, you know what you're up against. And that's absolutely true. I'm much more distracted these days. Nicole, I will do my best to pay attention <laughs> during this Thank webinar. You. I will try to make this content as engaging as possible. <laughs> so as presenters, we can't keep those distractions at bay. Unfortunately, they are here to stay for the foreseeable future, but we can grab their attention and make them want to listen to us. We hear so many speakers say, I feed off the energy of my audience, and we think that's a great idea, but hmm, what do you do when it's uh, not possible? <laughs> to have a live audience to feed off of in the first place. That's true. I mean, w you and I can't hear our audience, even though we know they're live. And also sometimes some of our clients these days record their presentation to be That's broadcast right. at a later time. So your audience has to be in your imagination. They're in the future. That's right. So you can't rely on them. It is up to you as the presenter to invite them to dance so to speak. And now my colleagues have previously presented ways to grab the audience's attention. For those of you who have been on our Calm series, uh, Calm Together series episodes in the past, you've heard my colleagues talk about how to grab your audience's attention with your delivery and your design. Charity talked about how visuals can grab their attention and Jeff talked about how you say what you say can also grab their attention. So today, there's one final segment left. We're gonna talk about content, that third leg of the presentation stool. Got it. So content, very simply, is what you say in your mm -hmm. virtual engagements, and it is not to be discounted. Your content certainly matters when you're in person, but it matters even more when you're communicating virtually, and there are some key differences that you wanna keep in mind. Ooh, I like that. Everyone, did you see what Nicole did there? She's building up some suspense as to what happens next. And we're going to interrupt the suspense. Before we let Nicole get into the details, we'd first like to hear from you. So think about a virtual presentation you've sat through in the past couple months. We know you've sat through a lot. We imagine there were some that really kept your attention. They kept you out of your inbox, away from the Tiger King, whatever else was going on. <laughs> that made you sit at the edge of your kitchen chair, your dining room chair, and really engage, really listen. 
So what was it about their content that grabbed and kept your attention? What did they say that kept your attention? What did they say that kept you there? It could be words, phrases, ideas, things that surprisingly brought you in that you didn't expect. Uh, we'd love for you to put those in the chat. Um, and this is our way of knowing that the chat box is working for everyone. So put it in the content comments of whatever platform you're watching us on, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and uh, we should be able to see all of them. And sometimes they take a minute to come in and our producers might drop those into the, the private chat for us, Nicole, so you can see those too. All right, I'm not seeing anything yet. So we're gonna move on and we'll come back if we start to see a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of comments there. Oh, candor about what they're feeling right now. Yeah. Uh, people not shouting. That's a popular one. We talked about microphones previously. Uh, I enjoy when someone is honest and personable, sharing a personal story, anything that links to direct application. I take that to mean things I can use right away. Mm -hmm. uh, a great narrative, storytelling. Yeah. Useful content and very genuine human connections. Oh, there's some great stuff in here. And awesome. Yeah. Too many for us to get all of them. Uh, but I think you're going to hear some of these echoed today in some of Nicole's tips. So, yeah. Nicole, let's jump right in. Awesome. So today we're going to cover five things that you can do to create great content virtually. We're going to cover the importance of the length of your presentation, how important introductions are to grabbing them right off the bat, stories, as some of you mentioned, transitions to keep the connection between points, and creating contrast. Awesome. Shall we start with uh, number four or we could. We'll, start, we'll start with number one. <laughs> okay. Tip number one, keep it short. Everyone is multitasking folks, whether you want them to or not. They are home as we explained, there's a lot going on there. And it's important that you keep your virtual presentation or meeting concise. Not only your overall presentation, but also the individual sentence length as well. Sounds like there's two different tips there. Uh, two very different things, the length of your meeting, but also while you're speaking, everything that comes out of your mouth can be can be shorter. So let's talk about the meeting length first. Yeah, so when it comes to your overall presentation length, again, you have to keep it short. Gone are the days of these 60 minute narratives. Sitting through a 60 minute meeting in person, I found pretty difficult most of the time unless the speaker and the content were both really engaging and exciting. Virtually, it's just about impossible. I've got a million other things to distract me. Now, a half an hour, I can probably do that and give you my full attention. 15 minutes, that's even better. Got it. This this topic came up, in fact, when we first proposed this webinar series, we talked about yep. how long to make it. And we decided that we'd rather have 30 really interesting minutes than 45 or 60 ordinary minutes. And it's it's harder. It's harder to get yes. your, your time down. Uh, you have to pack it in and trim. You have to edit a lot. That's right. You really need to decide what is most important and think about how you can offer that same message in a more concise way. I, I bet you can. And you know what? Your audience will love you for giving them the extra time back and they'll be more likely to absorb everything that you said. So it's a win win. And keeping it short not only matters, like we said, at the presentation level, it matters at the individual sentence level as well. Mm, OK, so show us what you mean there. Okay, so this is some content that I took directly from the Duarte website, but I've manipulated it a bit to make it really lengthy. Some people don't realize how long their content is unless they read it out loud and then they realize, oh my gosh, when I go to deliver this, this is not gonna be something the audience is able to absorb. So listen to this and how long it is. Your presentations are the best opportunity to tell your story and inspire people to act. And at Duarte, we help you write, design and deliver groundbreaking stories and visual presentations for every occasion. So you can be, I mean, I gotta stop because I'm out of breath. It's really, really long. So Still, I want to hire Duarte already. It sounds so compelling. Whoever right. The content is amazing, but let's take a look at how much more amazing it could be and how much more you might absorb of this amazing message if you shorten your sentence length. Okay. Instead, oh, yeah. you want to do this. So chunk up your sentences in your script. Great easy tip, remove conjunctions like and and so, and see if you can make your sentence no more than 10 words on average. So we'll just read a couple sentences. These shorter sentences are forcing me to pause in between and that's gonna help you absorb it. 
Your presentations are the best opportunity to tell your story. They're an opportunity to inspire people to act. Duarte helps you write, design, and deliver groundbreaking presentations for every occasion. So guys, your audience needs to hear your message and they'll hear it better if the messages mm. are presented in these shorter bursts. And I hear in that too, Nicole, that with every period, almost it comes an implicit pause. That's right. Where you're putting some space in between them for, for them to absorb what you're saying. Uh, so that's a great tip. So 10 word sentences and remove your conjunctions whenever you can. Yep, indeed. Uh, Works every great. time. Great. Okay, next tip. All right, tip number two, you need a strong introduction. A lot of speakers don't think about this, they don't bother with it, or they just assume that it's not important. It is. Studies show that you've got about 30 seconds to grab your audience's attention before they say, oh man, it's gonna be that kind of a presentation. <laughs> or, oh, it's gonna be that kind of a presentation. So we need one that's strong, that's interesting, that's memorable, so that your audience stays engaged from the very, very beginning. I'm rethinking what my introduction was today. <laughs> which one Which one did we create in people? I don't um, know, but no, before we <laughs> tell you what to do, we're gonna tell you what not to do. See if you're, you're in this boat, Doug. Okay. So one thing we see all the time is, I'm really excited to be here. Oh, I bet you see this all the time too. <laughs> I hate There's this. a couple no. problems with this beginning. Number one, you hear this so often that you don't even hear it anymore. It doesn't really mean anything. It's forgettable, it's expected. And number two, nobody ever seems to mean it. <laughs> You're not really excited when you say this. It's yep. like yep. something to say. And that's not to say that you absolutely can't use it, but if you do, it better be memorable and you better mean it. I love that. So don't say you're excited unless you're gonna sound excited. That's correct. This is where the content and delivery are sort of fused together. Got it. Okay, what's another no-no? Okay, so here's a big no-no. You've heard this one a thousand times too. Totally forgettable. Hi, my name's Nicole. I'm an executive speaker coach with Duarte. Today, we're gonna talk about content for your virtual presentations. Wow. That is so boring. <laughs> wow. you know, I, do you have to introduce yourself? Sure, but you can do better by grabbing some, grabbing them in a different way and then introducing yourself. This is not gonna knock anybody out. Got it, got so it. So instead, here's what we recommend. These are a couple different ways that you can give an introduction. Try, hmm. try one of these and see how it works. You can create an analogy that ties to your content. Get everyone on the, an even playing field and an even level of understanding. That's interesting. You mm -hmm. can give them a statistic that wows them. We did that up front with that 80% of folks who are from home that Forbes quote um, are feeling distracted. That was yep. pretty engaging. Um, you can give a powerful visual. You know, They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Just put an, an impactful photograph up there. Sometimes that speaks for itself. An interesting quote. And certainly, as some of you alluded to earlier, a story. Stories are great. I so love that. So five, those are five great ways to open a presentation. That's great. That's right. Yeah. Try try each one of them. And depending on your audience, see, see what wows you. But they're all infinitely better than just introducing yourself and tell the, telling them what you're going to tell them. Boring. Mm. Got it. All right. So speaking of stories, tip number three. Oh, great is stories win. Apparently humans like stories. So I'm going to I'm going to start with one myself. Oh, let's hear so, it. People remember stories and I have got a perfect example of this. When I was growing up, we used to eat dinner family style, meaning my mom would put these giant dishes of food on our table and we would help ourselves. My dad's one rule with family style was take all you want but eat all you take. And that was drilled into my head as a kid. Take all you want, eat all you take. Take all you want, eat all you take. Well, as a kid, Sometimes I was a picky eater. That didn't really sit well with me. Sometimes I would eat all I took and sometimes I would not. Well, then one day my dad pivoted and instead of giving me that statement, he gave me a story about how his parents, my grandparents grew up really poor in Poland and how sometimes they didn't have food to eat and they would have to share very small portions. They didn't have the beautiful scrambled eggs that I had in front of me. And that really got to me, especially because it brought out an emotion of my dad when he delivered it. And I tell you what, that stuck with me. And from then on, I ate what I took and I took only what I wanted to eat. So it's just one example of how stories are so much more impactful than statements. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And most of our, most 
folks know Duarte as expert storytellers. Um, we've always known that stories are impactful at Duarte. There's a reason that kids like bedtime stories, that we all like to tell stories around a campfire. They're memorable and they get our audience's attention. And it turns out that stories are really helpful in our virtual world too. 55% of folks say that a great story captures their focus and keeps them engaged with their content. Hmm. So when we can't all be in the room together, like now, stories make us feel as if we are, and a good story will keep them interested no matter how many virtual distractions surround them. Now, Nicole, I hear this worry from clients sometimes, <laughs> and we've seen these comments before too about this word stories. Yeah. Um, do you mean fairy tales? Do they all have a beginning, middle, end? Are we are we talking about Battlestar Galactica and Game of Thrones? Is is that what we mean by stories? Hey, you know what? If that's appropriate, sure, grab them, but not necessarily. Yes, the the word story feels very heavy to some people, but there are a variety of stories that you could use that don't feel so beginning, middle, end, once upon a time ish. Mm. So we love personal stories. We think that the more personal the story, the better, but we also understand that those can feel very vulnerable to some people. So like your dad so, talking about his his parents. Yeah, that was uh, a personal that's story. Just a personal story, okay, got that's it. Right. And I, I like that, I feel comfortable with that, but we totally understand that, especially in a business setting, some people don't, and that's okay. So instead, you can try a customer story. Mm -hmm. Tell a story of a customer who is in your audience's shoes so they can picture themselves in that position, making that transformation. It could be a time business-wise that you were in the audience's shoes. You could tell them, hey, you know, I've been here before where you are and I know it's challenging, but this is how I overcame it. And it doesn't even have to be a full story. It could be a simple bit of a story or an anecdote. Like I could say, hey, you know, Doug and I were chatting about this webinar the other day, and he said, "Ooh, that... don't tell him what I said. Don't tell him." What I said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it, right? These are these are great tips too. There's another four great kinds of stories you can tell in any presentation, uh, especially a virtual one. Okay, on to the next tip. Awesome. Tip number four: as great as stories are, if that's all you use, they're gonna lose their impact. Our content developers, myself included, we really like to mix up the content when we write for our clients because when you surprise your audience and how you talk about something, their ears perk up and they pay more attention. So to use an analogy, in the before times, I used to commute to work via <laughs> car. And I, I hate to say it, but I do kind of miss it. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I used to drive the same route every day in the same car, listening to the same type of music, and I was on autopilot, pun intended, um, because I drove the same roads and I really didn't have to pay too much attention before I knew what I was home. Yep. Once in a while though, there would be an unexpected accident or a detour or some sort of crazy traffic pattern and I was forced to pay more attention mm. to my driving. So your audience, especially a familiar audience, they're on autopilot too. And they're expecting the expected. So instead, you want to surprise them. Use contrast to keep them engaged. So instead of just talking about your solution, talk about the problem and then the solution. Mm. Compare the past with the present. You can talk about the before situation and the after situation. Um, if you talk about all stories, then you want to throw in a data point. And if you have all data, then you want to throw in a story. I want to highlight that what is what could be because Nancy Duarte, our, our awesome CEO in her book Resonate and in our workshop Resonate, <clears throat> mm -hmm. we talk about um, what is and what could be. And she did um, some amazing series of studies for some of the best speakers and some of the best speeches of all time. And she found this pattern. They toggle back and forth between what is and what could be, what is and what could be. That creates contrast and it gives the audience something they weren't expecting. That's great. This is another list of four great ways you can build contrast in your presentation. This is a, this is a your whole presentation, Nicole, is a great example of trimming out the fat and getting it to a concise 30 minutes. Um, there's a lot of tip density in here and that's yeah. great to see. So great. thank you. You're All right, so onto our, onto our last category here, yeah. last tip. Our last tip is use good transitions that helps your audience track what you're talking about. They are critical to your audience's understanding. If you don't connect the dots for them, they are likely to miss something 
and then to totally tune you out. Like I, I don't even know where, where this person is anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, the worst transitions, <laughs> we hear this all the time. You click on your next slide and the speaker says, so um, this slide is about this or on this slide, we're mm -hmm. going to discuss this, man. And they don't, they often don't even know they're doing it. Um, right. I'm a, I'm a speaker coach too. And, and one thing I'll do with speakers is they'll present for a little while. And I say, all right, what were the first two words of that slide? And they'll, they can't remember. And inevitably the first two words were so, um, so, um, and they start every slide with those. So that's when you're on autopilot, like you said before, yeah. and you're not thinking and you have this repeated pattern that comes in and that becomes your transition. That's right. So, yeah. so talk to us about what, what's the mark of a good transition then? Yeah, you got it. So the first thing you want to do is to make them natural and conversational. When you switch slides, it doesn't mean that your content has to also feel separated and siloed in these like compartments. Instead, you want to think of your content as this one seamless connected story, even though you're advancing the slides. So the next tip is to make sure that those are helpful. Helpful transitions are the ones that answer a rhetorical question that might be in the minds of your audiences. For, ex for example, if at the end of the current slide, your audience might be asking, well, how the heck are we going to implement that? Your transition sentence might be, we're going to implement this in two ways. Click. Now you've connected the dots between between slides and answering those assumptive questions. It helps the audience connect the dots. Got it. Finally, you want to make sure those transitions are interesting whenever possible. Rather than using the same expected one, you can build suspense by teeing it up before you click on your next slide. So you can say something like, we've been waiting for months to unveil this new plan to the team. And we're really excited to do that now. And but only if you're really excited. <laughs> only if you're really excited and only if there's really something exciting to reveal. Right. You won't have those moments on every single transition and you shouldn't because overly excited transitions are still boring if you use them repeatedly. Right. The contrast rule. That's right. Com comes back in. This is great. Make your transitions natural, make them helpful, make them interesting. Um, and we're going to give people in a few minutes a chance to ask questions about transitions, uh, everything else we talked about, building in contrast, your introductions, things like that. So I'm doing the same thing by setting up what's coming later, maybe building some suspense, suspense for our question and answer period. Yay. Okay, so five great tips on content today. Yep. Are you, uh, should we recap? Well, there is one more tip, but one wait, more there's tip? more, we love that. <laughs> The final tip in making good content for virtual communication is to summarize. So we're going to do that for you right now. As okay. great as your content will be, if you have a short length, if you have great introductions, if you use stories, if you have transitions, and if you use contrast, oh, inevitably, someone will stop paying attention at some point. <laughs> so if you really want them to remember in this new, very distracted virtual world, you've got to repeat the gist, give them the key takeaway, remind them of their task. You've got to summarize. Um, and finally, I recommend ending your meeting in a summary way, something similar to this. If there's one thing I'd like you to remember, it's this. So I'll end there. If there's one thing I'd like you to remember for the, from this webinar, it is this with your content, with your delivery, with your design, when it comes to virtual communication, it is your job as the speaker to capture and keep their attention. That's so great, Nicole. All right, thank you. Now, oh, before awesome. we move to Q&A, see I'm teeing up the transition like you taught me. Love it. I know we have a lot of folks who want more help right now. So we have lots more to offer at Duarte. So let's do the big five countdown, Nicole. We've got five virtual workshops using all the interaction tools that you've heard about throughout this series, Visual Story, Data Story, Resonate, Captivate, our newest Captivate for virtual communication. Uh, we lost Nicole for a second. I'm sure she'll be back. We have four self-paced e-courses. They are 90 minutes to four hours, depending on which one. They cover story, design, and delivery. And our presentation principles e-course is free right now to anyone who's been laid off furloughed or had their hours cut due to the virus. Uh, that's still free until May 31st, and we'll put some information about that in the chat. 
we have three different packages of speaker coaching. That's one-on-one -on -one coaching for you or for your team. Those are available on our website. There are at least two places where you can find all of our past episodes, our blog at Duarte.com and our YouTube channel. Just search for Duarte Inc. on YouTube. Welcome back, Nicole. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, there is one more episode of Come Together, our season finale next Thursday, and we'll tell you more on that in a minute. But now we would be happy to answer any questions that you have. And I see uh, our producer, Emily, has put a couple of questions in the comments here for us. So one was, uh, do you guys practice before going live? Hmm. I'll, take that <laughs> as, I'll take that as a great compliment, compliment Nicole. Yes. Uh, what do you say to that question? Do we practice? I say there is a fine line between rehearsing and over rehearsing. So <laughs> we do we do practice. Uh, Doug and I run through one to make sure that our technology is working and that the slides are working, but also to make sure that our conversation and our banter sounds natural and that we haven't missed any of the content. I do have speaker's notes, but they are not something that I read. They're something that I look at in a glance and then I look back up at the camera and focus on you. Mm -hmm. If I were to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse that, my fear is that it would come across as scripted. It's okay if you don't say every single word exactly the way you wrote it because you do want all of your meetings and presentations to feel like a conversation rather than a presentation. You don't wanna feel presenty or rehearsed. Got it. Yeah, I agree with all that. Nicole and I are professional communicators. We've taught workshops many, many, many times together. So we're comfortable with a lot of back and forth. So I think um, that for us has been a lot of our rehearsal in the past. So when it comes to a webinar like this, um, we've, we've rehearsed that sort of thing a lot already. Um, yeah. So when we do a run through like we did yesterday, it's to get familiar with the technology, to practice a couple of the spots in particular, um, and then trust our, our practice. Um, okay, let's go to some more questions. Um, if you're in the middle of a talk, so like your content is already baked, you've mm -hmm. already written everything, what can you do in the middle of your talk to re-grab attention? If appropriate, find spots throughout your presentation to engage your audience. So instead of waiting for a Q&A at the end, like we did, because we were we were short, we wanted to get our tips out, you could potentially have Q&A in between segments where mm -hmm. you stop and you engage the audience and you say, okay, what questions do you have so far? Depending on the platform that you're using, Cody mentioned some things last week, you can engage them without necessarily engaging in dialogue. You can use um, you know, likes or clicks or polls or the chat box to re-grab their attention. If you set the expectation ahead of time that, hey, this is going to be a dynamic dialogue, this is going to be a conversation I expect and I would love for you to all participate, then you won't catch them off guard. So we say let them know up front and then find positions throughout to engage them in whatever way you think is appropriate. I love that. And I think it also ties back to something we teach in our Captivate workshops around being uh, empathetic as a presenter. Yeah. That when, when you notice you're losing them or you want to re-grab their attention, you're willing to stop and l let your content pause for a second and talk to them and be human right. and find a, a way to repeat something you said or say something new to pull them back in. Yep. That's it's right. like the difference between, you know, when you were a kid, uh, I don't know if you did, but we would go to amusement parks and they would have the rides where you'd get in a little car and you could drive it around, mm -hmm. but the car was on a track. So yeah. it was boring. It felt, well, I'm just on a track. I might as well be on a ride. You know, we wanted to be on something like bumper cars where you could go any direction you wanted, you know, yeah. and, and you have more control. Yeah. So I think this relates to another question that came in. How do you, how do you keep from falling into reading your content. Hmm. And I think that that relates back to don't be on a train track like that. Don't right. don't script every word you say you're That's going right. to say. Keep it more loose. And if you don't script everything, then you can't fall into reading your content. That's right. And what I find, by the way, research shows that writing, not typing, but writing out your content helps you to remember it. Mm -hmm. So if you have time, take 10, 15 minutes, write it out, write it out again, write it out again. But then 
put those aside. And if you need notes, that's okay. But make your notes three to five word bullets, just enough to jog your memory so that you then can talk freely and conversationally about that topic. Um, so it's okay to write it out, but don't read what you wrote out. That's great. Yeah, handwriting uh, makes a big difference. Um, how about, Nicole, I know this is something you've coached people on, mm -hmm. tips for making a presentation to an audience that speaks a different language than you do. Yeah, well, well we've got all kinds of delivery tips, but I'm gonna stick with the content theme first. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think the shorter sentences tip is really critical here. You wanna imagine that your audience has a translator with them. What does that translator translator need in order to take that content from your language to the audience's language? They need time, they need a pause. Shorter sentences and moments of silence in between will help your audience who speak a different native language than you absorb that content, even if the way you speak sounds different from them. So make sure as you're writing your content, you stick to those chunked sentences. That will help them a lot. Mm. Okay, one last question, uh, and then I think we're about out of time. So when you're telling a story, how long is too long for a story? <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. Well, we don't have any hard, fast rules to that, but I, I tell you, as a speaker, I start to feel when uh, it, it's getting too lengthy, whether it's a story or, or otherwise. Story, remember the purpose of the story. The, the story is really to connect to the grander purpose of your content. So especially if you're using it as an introduction, it's gotta be an example where they can immediately see that you've connected that story to your grander message, to the grander takeaway. So that doesn't mean it should be five seconds. It's whatever it is to feel complete to get your point across. So it's it's sometimes helpful to start not with the beginning of your story, but to think, what do I want them to take away from this story? Mm. Start with the, um, the move to, and then you can say, okay, will my story get my audience to that point? And that's all the content you need to do that. I think that I, I love that. I think it's also um, it's also practice. You know, yeah. you're learning how uh, practice telling stories to people. In fact, practice telling stories to kids. Oh and yeah, you'll, and you'll learn really quick how long and <laughs> too long. You know, they they'll tell you for long stories. Yeah, they well they'll sit if it's interesting and good. That's right. So you'll learn where that you know if you could plot that on a chart. Uh, interesting and good can be longer mm -hmm. or boring has to be very, very short. That's right. So <laughs> it, kids will teach you to calibrate yourself for the- Yeah, the and ask story. your colleagues. I mean, all of this, yeah. th listen, this is new for, for all of us, for a lot of us. So make sure that if you're unsure about your content, run it by your colleagues, someone who knows you, who knows the message and ask them, is this too long? Does it have enough contrast, et cetera? And they'll, they'll help you. That's awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, this was fun. It was. And we've reached the end of another episode. So I'd like to thank some people, Emily, our producer, as well as Kat, Alexa, and Julie for their work behind the scenes. If you've been sending us comments and they've been writing back, uh, you have those, those folks to thank. Nicole, thank you for being so smart and for waking <laughs> us all up today with your thank energy you. and enthusiasm. You got and it. To our audience, thank you all for tuning in. We love seeing your comments. We love hearing back from you. Uh, we love to get the opportunity to talk to you once a week like this. Yeah. And speaking of that, don't forget to tune in next week for our season finale. Next Thursday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, I'll be your host once again, and we'll have a surprise guest or guests. And we're putting together a really fun Ooh. show for you. So. Uh, please tune in for our final show. We can't wait to see you there. And we just may have some announcements about what's coming next in the webinar world for Duarte. So thank you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>